There's always that day when you know Christmas is over. You have any of that feeling yet? Uh, it could be like when the grace period for presents being out in the living room is over. Do you, kids, do you know about that? If you don't, you need to know about this. Uh, but there is a grace period where after you open presents, you can leave them out just anywhere until one day your parents decide without any warning that's over. Right? That period then it's like everything's got to get put away. Christmas is over. Maybe for you is when the weather hits 75 degrees. <laughs> You're like, oh, I guess Christmas is over. Or maybe it was like that little bit of resentment that you had when you saw your Christmas decorations one morning because you knew you were going to have to like make more trips up to the attic. And you're going, okay, I guess Christmas is over. See, a lot of times we have this like hard stop on Christmas. But could you imagine if you were reading an incredible novel and you're just page by page, the story is building, and then all of a sudden you're introduced to the hero you think, wow, there's all this anticipation and this excitement about the hero, and now he's, he's in the story, and what, what are we going to do? And you just close the book and put it on the shelf, and you don't come back to it for another year, and then you only read that same part over and over again. Could you imagine what that would be like? It would be terrible. Well, Christmas can't have a hard stop in our lives because Christmas is part of a so much bigger story. A much, much bigger story. It's a part of a story that you and I are also a part of. God's bigger story that starts with the holiness and the glory of God. And then we're introduced to mankind who rebels against God. But instead of God wanting revenge against that, he longs for redemption for his people. And so much so that he sends a rescuer, a rescuer to bring his people back into relationship with him and to redeem people and to establish his eternal and glorious reign as king over all. This is the huge story the Bible tells, but here's where it gets really cool. God told this huge story in the span of about five chapters to the prophet Isaiah. From Isaiah 6 to 11, God tells this whole story from his glory all the way till the redemptive end of time where he reigns over all things. And it's this great, great arc of story right in these five chapters. It tells kind of a, a microcosm of the whole story of the Bible. We've been introduced to the rescuer, the hero of our story, because in Isaiah's chapter 7 and 9, we get these very specific prophecies about who Jesus is, about how the Savior, the hero, would be introduced to us, would be born into this world. And it's happened. 700 years before Jesus was born, these incredible prophecies fulfilled. What does it have to do with us? What do these ancient writings have to do with today? Well, Christmas, I think, is proof that God's bigger story is true. And if that, if that resonates with you, you know then, too, you're also part of God's bigger story. We know the king, we know the hero of eternity who made rescue from sin and death available to all, which means we are either right now living as rescued people or people who have yet to be rescued. But before God speaks through Isaiah about judgment on people who reject rescue, which is coming, chapters 13 and on are a lot about the judgment that God has on people who reject his rescue and redemption. Before he does that, he ends this big story with one chapter that is a picture of what life looks like as a rescued person in God's big story. And so Isaiah chapter 12 is what I want to look at today to show us what is the rescued life, the Christian life, supposed to be like in God's mind. So I want to just start from the very beginning of Isaiah 12 and talk about first the reality of rescue, how we come into the Christian life. This is the reality of rescue. If you have a Bible and you can turn with me there or not, you can look on the screen and check out Isaiah chapter 12 verse 1 where it says, on that day you will say, I will give thanks to you, Lord, Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. 
I'll give thanks to you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Now, we don't like to think about God as angry, do we? Because we also know God to be loving, and sometimes in our human b- brains, we think, well, how can, they be, how can God be both? How, how can God be both angry and loving? It's hard for us to see him as loving if we recognize he's angry, but his anger is real. His wrath is real, and it's also righteous. Like, he's in the right when he's angry. We deserve God's anger. We deserve God's wrath. But God's love is also real, so real, that God was willing to turn his anger onto himself in order to prove his love to us, something we didn't deserve at all. So yeah, he is angry. He he is anger towards sin and sinful people, but his love is so much greater, so great, that the hero, the rescuer, would shoulder the wrath of God on the cross. This is the story of Jesus. Jesus, who is the king over all, knew that we we could do nothing to avoid God's wrath, and so he willingly came and shouldered God's wrath on our behalf in the greatest act of love mankind has ever known. So, was God angry with me before I was rescued? Yeah. But love one out because God is most naturally loving. There's this uh, author who writes about Puritan theologians and you don't have to know anything about Puritans or theologians to understand this. It's a really great analogy. He said that if God was a balloon and you pricked him with a pin, what would most naturally come out of him would be love. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that there is no anger there, that there's no wrath towards sin and sinful people who reject his redemption and rescue, it just means that he's most naturally loving, like he's on the edge of his seat ready to love. The Bible says that he is slow to anger and he's abounding in love, right? So while we get angry quickly and we take a long time to love, God loves quickly and his anger can take a long time to play out, but love is the most natural thing to him. If you pricked him with a balloon, that's what would come out. Like a balloon, that's what would come out. Love would just come pouring out. And so, yes, his anger is a reality. But his love is a greater reality. And this is good, good news for us because there was nothing we could do to escape his anger on our own. His love won because he turned his anger on himself to shoulder his wrath. That's what the hero came to do. We know the hero is Jesus Christ. This is what the book of Romans says in the New Testament in chapter 5, verse 10. It says, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. You see, God made a personal appeal to you and I by sending the rescuer as a person. So Christianity is not just a religion to adhere to. Christianity is not, uh, is not simply a, a, a family you're raised into. Have you heard that? I'm a Christian because my parents were Christians. I was raised in a Christian home. Well, that's not the reality. Instead, Christianity is something you are rescued into. That is the only way to become a Christian, is to be rescued into Christianity by the hero the rescuer, Jesus Christ, who gave his life on the cross so that we could come to him by faith. That is the truth. That's how to become a Christian. And so when you realize just how desperate a situation you were in and just how powerful God's love is towards you, there's only two ways to respond. Just like uh, Isaiah hears from God here, he says, on that day, uh, I'll give thanks to you. That's one way. Give thanks to God. God, thank you for my rescue. I recognized how desperately wicked I was. I recognized how I was in the path of your anger and wrath, but I didn't do anything to avoid it or sidestep it. Instead, I was helpless in that, and you reached down and pulled me up out of it. Jesus, the hero, rescued me. So we thank God that we're no longer in the path of his anger. Or the second thing, we realize just how desperate a situation we were in and just how powerful God's love is. 
is maybe you need to ask God to rescue you today from sin and death, and he will. It's available even now. In fact, Peter, who knew Jesus and later wrote a letter to a bunch of Christians, he said this, the Lord is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so even today, if you think, wow, I think God's still angry with me. I don't have a testimony or a story of repentance and following Jesus by faith. I don't know that Jesus has rescued me from my sin. I just want to tell you that's available to you. And even today, on the first day of 2023, you can grab the card that's right in front of you or go online to moberly.org slash next, and you can tell somebody that you'd like to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ because that's what Christianity is. It's a relationship with the rescuer. And that's the second thing we see in Isaiah chapter 12. This is the Christian life God designed. It's a relationship with the rescuer. Not only does he pull us out of God's path of anger and into the comfort eternally of a relationship with him, he gives us friendship. He knows us and allows us to know him. Verse 2 says this, Isaiah 12 Indeed, God is my salvation. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Okay, the Bible describes salvation as a gift. Several times the Bible talks about this salvation as a gift. And you've probably done a lot of gift giving or gift receiving over the last couple weeks. So we sort of understand what this transaction looks like. Uh, Gift giving with extended family is always a toss-up because my experience this last couple weeks was we had extended family texting us going, would you just please tell me exactly what you want for Christmas? And I'm going, that kind of misses the point of the whole gift thing, right? Like, shouldn't you just like want to give me a gift and not just want to buy something that I could go get for myself? I don't know. So you go travel to a family's house and you do a little gift exchange. And what's interesting about this Uh, this whole interaction is that when you leave, you take the gift with you, but the family stays. And even though you have the gift, you separate again from that family member for, I don't know, a year or more sometimes until the next time you have to go exchange another gift, right? And that's how gift giving sort of works in our culture. But the gift of salvation is different. It's different. Salvation is not something to receive. Salvation is someone to receive. Look closer at the two bookend phrases in verse 2. It says, God is my salvation. God is my salvation. He has become my salvation. You see, Jesus didn't just give us a gift. The giver is the gift. In 2007, I bought an engagement ring for Jill. Uh, I say bought. I put it on a credit card. It was a bad idea, but yeah, so I didn't really buy it. But it, it, I, it cost me more than it should have cost. Let's just say that. I went to great cost, right, for this engagement ring for Jill. And then I went to great lengths to ask for her hand in marriage. I mean, we drove to a different city. We did this little whole, like, park picnic thing, and it's not as cool. Like, we didn't have Pinterest back then to be able to tell us all these cool ways to ask people to marry. So I just did my best, okay? But it was great. It was a great link that I went to uh, to ask Jill to marry me. And I remember being on one knee under this, like, trellis with vines growing on it, and this really cool. Am I making you nervous, Jill? Okay, yeah. Uh, so, and it was, I was down on one knee. I opened this little box. Can you imagine... If Jill would have said yes to the ring and no to the relationship, (laughs) that was, I mean, it's a nice ring, but that's not an option, is it? Because the ring is a symbol of a covenant relationship that you make with the person. It's a relationship with our rescuer. God is my salvation. He became my salvation. It was expensive, the ring, right? Salvation was expensive. The covenant of salvation is to give your whole selves to one another. 
your whole selves, all of you, to one another. And Jesus did that first. And then we respond to him in the same way. So do you want a life without fear? Wow, that'd be a great 2023, wouldn't it? Fear is a plague in our culture. Do you want a life without fear? Do you want a life that's full of joy? A life that's full of strength? Give yourself fully to Jesus who gave himself fully for you. Trust him. That's what that word means. I will trust him. I will give myself fully to him because he started it by giving himself fully for me. And that's where we find the fullness of strength and the fullness of joy. It's a relationship with the rescuer. And then in finally, verse 3 is we get to experience in God's design for the Christian life, the rescued life, we get to experience the rewards of rescue. The rewards. A lot of Christians start the new year saying things like they want to be closer to God. And maybe that's why you're here today, is actually because you, you thought like, well, I want to put in some more effort this year to be closer to God. Or maybe I want to be more consistent with my Bible reading, or I want to be more consistent with my prayer life or whatever it might be, where you think, I want to do something this year in 2023 to get closer to God. But can I just tell you, if your memories of your Christian life, if you look back on your Christian life, if your memories of your spiritual life are all centered on being or not being good enough, or being or not being disciplined enough, then you aren't living the rescued life that God designed for you. Because you can never get closer to God than he has already made himself to you. He went the distance by sending the rescuer to shoulder his wrath, to make salvation possible, to start life eternal with you in relationship. God did all that. We receive it. This is the beauty. It's the reward of salvation. This is the truth of the rescued life. That we can't earn any more of God's closeness or favor. He's given it all to us already. We just get to reap the rewards of that. Another way to say this is that the saved life is not a life of producing for God. It's a life of receiving from God. So this is what... The prophet repeats from the Lord in verse 3. He says, you will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. You will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. To me, this is a definition of the spiritual life. Now, this is hard to swallow because for a long time, we've been taught that the spiritual life is our effort toward God. That somehow if we do enough things that we'll be close to God. But actually the opposite is true. God did everything that was necessary to be close to us. And now the definition, God's design for the spiritual life is that we joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. Let me just pick out a couple of those words and talk about what those might mean to you. First, joyfully. Joyful, that the life God designed for the person who's rescued by the hero Jesus is not a life of duty, it's a life of delight. And in fact, if there is duty, it's because of delight. And so we joyfully interact with God in this relationship. And then it says we joyfully draw water. Water, this life giving, life sustaining substance, reminds me of John chapter 14, uh, excuse me, John chapter 4, verse 14, uh, which Jesus is having a conversation at a water well with a woman. And he says this He says, Whoever drinks from the water that I give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. So water, this life-giving, this life-sustaining substance leads us into eternal life, that it's always there. He says we, we draw water from it. Now this implies rhythms, 
I got to go with uh, Eddie to Africa a couple of years ago and some others in our church, and, and we traveled the villages in Malawi, and, and some missionary partners of ours had been drilling water wells uh, in villages, which were like, water is life. I think that's the motto in Africa, right? Water is life. And so villages are formed like, as close to water as possible. And then if they can get clean water from a well, that's even better. But there's these little, I remember sitting on a porch with a pastor talking about life, and a little boy walks by on a Sunday afternoon with a huge bucket of water on his head. And I'm thinking, I don't even think I could do that. And I was asking the pastor about this, and he said, this is the rhythm of life here, is you go and you draw water, and then you use it. And you draw water. It's a daily rhythm. You draw water for that day. So what if the design that God had for us in a life of being rescued was a daily rhythm of joyfulness and and partaking in the life-giving, life-sustaining water of salvation? What would it look like to be formed daily by this, to establish a rhythm of it. We have been spoiled by having water on tap. I mean, we get water on demand, right? And the problem is that that's how we start to treat the spiritual life. That we might just feel like, well, if I get thirsty enough, I'll go to the faucet. But what if the design that God had for us, where the most joy is, is establishing daily rhythms of drawing from Him as the source, instead of waiting until you know, we haven't, we've run out of ourselves. What if we start by emptying ourselves and only going to him, drawing water joyfully? It says it's a spring. It's an unending supply. It never runs dry. And it's something that we can't muster or manufacture on our own. This salvation, this life with God, it's joy-filled because It's something that we can't produce on our own. It's a gift, and it's continual. It's always there. And then I want you to notice one more thing that happens here from verses 1 and 2 to verse 3. If you look at verse 1, it says, I will give thanks to you, Lord. Right? You were angry with me, but your anger turned away. You comforted me. It's a singular reflection. Verse 2 Indeed, God is my salvation. Again, singular. But look what happens in verse 3. It says, you will joyfully draw water. And that you is a plural you. Which I take to mean that the spiritual life is to be enjoyed in community. The spiritual life is to be enjoyed in community. In fact, a shift happens here from this point forward on verse 4 and following through the rest of the chapter that if we begin this daily rhythm of drawing water from the springs of salvation, if our joy is full of life with God and life together in community, then our lives overflow the work that God is doing in us. Then we start giving thanks to the Lord. We proclaim His name. We make His works known. We sing to Him. All these incredible, we cry His name out. I mean, there's all these incredible external things if we would start by living these daily rhythms and living them with God and with one another. It happens in community. And so you're going to have a tendency this year to go, I want to do more for God. I want to live my life more consistently for God. And you're going to try to think like all the daily things you can do, the disciplines you can do. I just want to remind you, God has already done everything necessary to be close to you. You just have to meet him there. And it's best to meet him there with others. It's most joyful to meet him at the spring of salvation with other people. So two ways that I want to lead us to practically respond to this today. Number one, something that all of Moberly is doing over the next few months, which is called the Homefront Initiative. Challenge number one is that we would be daily formed spiritually. That we would take every day for the next few months and we would spend time reading our our scripture and praying. Practicing life with God on a daily basis. Creating rhythms. There's even a QR code up on the screen. If you'd like to scan that, you can put your email address in there and we'll send you resources and we'll send you help things along the way. uh, Some books to read, some things to do. and, And we can do it together in community. 
joyfully drawing from the springs of salvation. The second thing that's a practical takeaway and application is to join a connect group. You may feel a little bit alone in your journey right now. And that's natural if you're not in strategic and intentional community. And it takes work. It takes effort. And it takes some awkwardness. And it takes moving your schedule around. It takes all these things to do these things. But the joy of salvation comes when we live life with God and life with one another. This is the way God designed the rescued life to be. The story of God, which starts with his glory his holiness, and ends with his glory and his holiness, is all designed around us living life with him and life with one another. And so if you want joy out of the Christian life this year, if you want to experience life with God, it's going to happen best when you experience life with others as well. And so plug into the Homefront Initiative. Figure out how you can design your life and your home around Christ, and then Get into life with others. Join a connect group, moberly.org slash connect, or you can stop by the back of the room on your way out today and we can help you find a group. We're praying for new groups to start this January and that would be a great way to practically plug in to what God could be doing in your life this year in 2023. The moral of the story is be encouraged. Be encouraged because God made salvation available to you. God is good. The rescuers come. We've been introduced to him. The hero's here. Now let's live life into that reality. I want to pray for you and ask Haley to come and lead us through one more song before we dismiss today and continue our worship. Let's pray. God, thank you for your goodness, for your grace toward us, that you introduced us to the rescuer, that revenge wasn't your plan, but redemption is. God, we pray that each person here would know Jesus as their personal rescuer, the Savior from sin and death, the Lord and leader of our lives, that we would live into that reality that Jesus is king over all, establishing his eternal reign. And as we draw from that well, as we enjoy life with you and life with others, we pray it would make a difference in our world. Thank you, Jesus, for each person here, our church family, those who couldn't be here today. We pray that you would work in their lives to draw them closer because you've drawn close to us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.